I am so pleased to be joined by track athletes and mother and daughter, Cynthia and Margaret Montalone. Ladies, thank you so much for being here. Aloha. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak up and use our voices. Yeah, uh, no, it's a real, real privilege to talk with you all. Uh, you all, as you say, aloha, you're down in Hawaii. I'm a little bit jealous of that. Love your background. <laughs> Mahalo. Yeah, we were talking about how a lot of people think it's virtual because it's so beautiful. And we're just, we're so fortunate to live in such a beautiful place. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it is gorgeous. Well, I want to begin by asking you to share a little bit about your own passion for running. You're both track athletes. How did you... Uh, become so interested in running and, and become athletes? Which one should go first, me or? Yeah, go ahead okay. and jump in. All right. Um, so I actually used to run everywhere as a child. So my grandmother lived basically next door, about 100 yards away in the Catskill Mountains in New York. And I would run to her house all the time. I, anytime someone sent me to do something, I would be running. So I really felt at an early age that I liked to run. Um, and my daughter was the same way I noticed when she was growing up. Um, no one was asking her to do it. She was just doing it. And then um, my, let's see, it was, I think it was like ninth grade. My PE teacher, who also coached the track team, said, I was about eighth grade. She said, um, oh, you should run track. You're a 400 meter runner. And I tell her, wow, weren't you right? Because here I am 45 years old and I'm still a 400 meter runner. <laughs> wow. So, that is yeah. amazing. And that's not an easy race. I, I also ran track and I know that the 400 is like the most brutal race to run because coaches are like, yeah, this is pretty much a sprint, uh, yes. but it's a very long sprint. <laughs> yeah. It takes a lot of hard work and, and sacrifice to run the 400. Um, I think there's a story about Usain Bolt uh, had a bet with his coach. Like if I could run fast enough in the hundred, he wouldn't make him train for the 400 because <laughs> nobody wants to train for the 400. Um, but we love, we like it. We like the hard work. And, um, you know, as a coach, I really like the lessons that the hard work teaches. Mm -hmm. um, and we can get into that, but uh, yeah. So I fast forward, I re was recruited to run track in college um, because I did very well in high school for my local um, community. And so I was recruited to run at the U University of North Carolina, Wilmington, a Division I school. I ended up top five in the East Coast in the 500 indoor, which I think the 400's hard. <laughs> the 500's even harder. Um, and uh, yeah, and then just went on to have my career. I had three kids. And uh, at age 40, my daughter said to me, Mom, I want to run track in college on scholarship like you did. Can you train me for the 400? And that's where our, our recent story began. Yeah, yeah. So Margaret, for you, what is it about running that you love? I just really love how my training pays off and I love going to race and competitions and seeing how successful I can be running and it can provide me with so many opportunities like scholarships to college or even gold medals. I like traveling and I like just the whole sport is just so much fun to me. Yeah. Oh, that's so neat. Well, you all recently did a, a documentary with the Independent Women's Forum telling your story and explaining that you both now uh, have competed in track events against biological men. So let's kind of begin at the beginning of that story. Uh, Cynthia, I know that, you know, you decided as an adult, okay, I want to begin competing again. And in 2018, uh, you actually qualified for Team USA at the World Masters Athletics Championship in Spain. Before, uh, before you went and before that competition, you found out that you were going to be competing against a biological man. What were your thoughts when you learned that news? Um, well, I was just, you know, really curious as to the fairness of it. And I started to investigate the rules that were in place, um, you know, and I found the testosterone requirements. But whenever I asked, um, you know, who was, who was either checking on this or who was deciding these rules, I would sometimes at first get some interest and then it was swept under the rug. It was, oh, no, no, we, like we can't talk about that. Um, and I really felt like it, the, um, the people I, were, I was talking to, they were maybe telling, they were also curious, and then they were telling, being told to be quiet about it. Um, that was the feeling I got. And so, um, yeah, I was, I knew, so when I got there, I was expecting answers, and I still had no answers as to where, you know, what the fairness of this was and how they were going about checking if it was fair or which, of course, it's, there's, doesn't even matter about testosterone. Um, because it's still not fair. And so, uh, yeah, then I was, I was basically told 
that I shouldn't speak up, that if I really, for my own safety, I should stay silent. Um, so I said, nope, that's not going to work for me. <laughs> I'm going to continue to speak up because I want answers. And uh, as a, I, my job is a metabolic practitioner. And so I'm constantly reading science. I actually read about 50 medical journal articles or science uh, articles per week minimum. And so I'm familiar with um, the endocrine system and hormones and the science of it. And so I knew that something was something was up. Like, you know, why were these decisions being made when clearly biological males have an advantage over females that's not based on testosterone? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I was I was very confused as to why no one was giving me answers and why they were telling me to be quiet. So what was the result of that race back in 2018? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, I remember when I first started speaking up about this, um, it was back when I was still on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook anymore. But I had mentioned like, hey, like just women deserve a fair playing field. We've always been very compassionate to all athletes involved. And so um, I know, you know, I always keep things pretty stick to the facts, like women deserve a fair playing field. And and some um, uh, psychologist, I believe, had commented well you're just mad because you lost your race and I said well I'm oh, sorry you didn't get the memo I actually didn't lose <laughs> I beat this individual by a few tenths of a second but that doesn't mean it's not an issue um, because then that individual came back six months later and stood on the podium um, for a medal that my team that my teammate could have gotten so and, and the prize money that comes with it so there are so many opportunities that are lost for these women that are competing Um, And that was a much shorter race. So it gets very complicated in the way that um, people think, okay, well, just because you won, then it's not an issue. But then it's, of course, it's an issue because, you know, it's what we call comparably gifted and trained. So in, for instance, in the state of Hawaii in 2019, in the 400 meters in high school, uh, there are about almost 700 participants around that uh, for the boys 400 about 350 of them could beat the state champion female. 350, okay? So that means that my lesson to my girls that I coach, that hard work pays off, that lesson falls apart because quite literally a mediocre male, like right down the middle, mediocre, could beat a state champion female. And what if then they start training and then they're beating you know, the most elite females, basically. A high school boy could beat the most elite female athlete in the Olympics. So it just really doesn't make sense. So just because I may have won my particular race to someone who may have not been conditioned for that race, then that doesn't mean it's not an issue because then they came back in a shorter race where they definitely used their, you know, I would say their their hip structure and body structure, that sort of thing, to win that race. Um, yeah, so the critics will pick you know, one side or the other to argue either you didn't train hard enough or it's not an issue because you won, but you can't have it both ways. (laughs) No, you can't. Margaret, you have personal experience with this as well. You're in high school uh, at a private school in Hawaii and uh, you competed also against a biological man. Tell me about that experience. My freshman year of high school at my first ever high school track meet, uh, I competed against a biological male in my race, the 400 meter dash. Um, I knew this individual had definitely an advantage. They were physically bigger and stronger. And when I stepped on the line to run the race, I could tell that it was completely unfair. I ended up coming second into my race and it was super disheartening for me and my teammates. One of my teammates even said, "Uh, what's the point of doing track anymore? There's just no point if I'm just going to be displaced by this individual who's very much stronger than me and has an advantage. So I thought it was definitely unfair. And I thought it would be a lot more fair if we had a fair playing field. Yeah. By how much did that biological uh, man beat you? Um, I think it was about three or four seconds. Three or four seconds, I think. You could definitely tell. Yeah. Which for those who aren't familiar with uh, with timing and track, that is a massive amount of time. Uh, in in a 400 meter that that is very very significant do you remember at the end of that race Margaret what was going through your head I was uh, a little bit disheartened because I'd worked so hard through the whole year just training for this first ever meet my season and I just remember that I could have gotten first and I could have gotten first in my heat and 
it was really disappointing to me to see my hard work uh, pay off just for yeah. a second place. Cynthia, I know you know it's it's one thing to experience this yourself to compete against a biological man. It's another to watch your daughter compete against a transgender athlete. What what were you feeling? What were you thinking when you saw Margaret lose to that biological man? Well, you know, the first thing I thought in my eyes, she's clearly the winner. <laughs> um, but uh, the second thing I thought was uh, we need to just keep speaking up about this because this is not right. And I talked to some people about filing an uh, OCR complaint, Office of Civil Rights, and I was told you can't file a complaint. And I want to be really clear with your listeners that if someone tells you you can't file a complaint, they're wrong. You, Of course you can file a complaint. But that's the type of pushback that I immediately was getting, even in regards to her running. You can't file a complaint. Of course I can file a complaint. I'm a citizen. I have a right to file a complaint. So I did. And it took um, all the way from February until November for them to come back with the decision that because that individual went to a private school, it wasn't the jurisdiction of the Office of Civil Rights. So what had happened is uh, all of the departments, whether it's the HHSAA, Sporting uh, Association, or the MIL, our league, or the Department of Education, which oversees the MIL, so it really was their jurisdiction, they all kept throwing the ball to the other person. And so this is what we're seeing um, because nobody wants to address it um, and nobody wants to be at fault for something. But what they don't realize is that us, uh, women are going to keep speaking up about it and they are going to be at fault for discriminating against biological women. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that it has kind of become a game of pass the ball and, and no one's willing to actually step up uh, and make some real calls on this issue? Well, my theory is that um, it's just become politicized and it shouldn't be. And I'll tell you why it shouldn't be, because I know everyone I know, Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter the party. They all agree that this is unfair. So I, I just, you know, polling suggests that it's a very large amount. I want to say like 80 or 90 percent of all people, regardless of political affiliation, agree that, you know, we, sh we can't have this. Uh, yeah. They can't be in the same category. So I am just really concerned at the, um, the how it's been polarized um, by, you know, certain associations and individuals. And this, you know, this current administration has definitely polarized it by making their decisions and their policies. And it's unnecessary because everyone agrees that this should not be happening. Yeah. Margaret, for for you, have you spoken with your teammates about this issue? Is this something that, um, you know, fellow athletes at your school are talking about? Yeah, I've received mostly support from my teammates and from everybody because some of them have had to run up against this individual and some they all know the struggle of having trained so hard and having your hard work pay off and so yeah just yeah. I've received mostly support <laughs> that's really good that's good news and Cynthia as you mentioned you uh, you coach you coach women really at, at all levels um, what is the what is the response from you know other women that you're working with what are their thoughts on this situation Hey, again, like, wow, I, I coach everyone from high school athletes to Olympians. And, um, you know, today is actually a great day for me because I just had two of my clients this past weekend um, make the Olympic team. Oh, they both congratulations. Won, thank you. That's they, wonderful. They both won first place. Not only did they make the team, but they were they won the national title. So wow. um, they're just powerhouse women and they absolutely agree with me. And you know what? They both have different political affiliations and different beliefs about things, but they both agree that we cannot have biological men in the female category. And you know, the, the other side will say, they're, they used to have science as their argument and say, well, if you just change the testosterone, if you just change the hormones, then you know it's fair. But now that they've realized that the science has come out that doesn't, that proves otherwise, that even after hormone therapy and after gender reassignment surgery, that male-bodied athletes still have an advantage. Now their go-to argument is just, we just have to call them girls because that's what they want to be called, period. Mm. And no other arguments. And that just won't hold up. You know, that's not okay. We yeah. need to just keep speaking up because that does not make any kind of sense. It's not common sense. Um, and yeah, so I just encourage others to really use your voice and uh, you know in your, in your heart and in your instinct what's right and what's not right. 
and that you should speak up about that. Well, and like you say, this is a really challenging issue, Cynthia, and I think uh, so many people are afraid to speak out on it. What would be your response to someone that says, you know, it, it's not fair to not allow a transgender athlete to compete uh, with the gender that they identify with? Well, you know, I, I think, to be clear, I think everyone should compete. Like, I think all um, athletes should compete. Like, there is no banning anyone. Um, but it, that being said, it, there needs to be a distinction to keep the, the sport fair and to keep uh, biological women from, uh, th- to keep them advancing in the opportunities available to them. And when, um, when you actually consider only the struggle of the trans athlete, you're really doing an injustice and discounting the struggle of the female athlete that's worked so hard to get to that place. Because again, you could work so hard to be the number one state champion female, but 350 boys could take that place if they identify as a girl. I mean, that just doesn't make sense because the, you know, if you're number 349, you're obviously not working as hard as that female. Yeah. So what's your encouragement to other women or athletes who are either watching this issue or maybe experiencing a situation firsthand where they're having to compete against a biological man? What would you say to them? What should they do? Well, I would say to those athletes, absolutely have compassion for everyone, um, you know, and then make sure that you can use your voice and don't be afraid to use your voice because the facts are are there and common sense and science is behind you are behind you like you know you have all of the support you need you just have to use your voice because if everyone keeps using their voice then we we will be heard so what's next for you all margaret let's begin with you do you plan on continuing to run continuing to really speak out on this issue yeah i plan to continue to run i plan to run in college hopefully i can get a scholarship And I definitely continue to uh, plan to speak out on this issue because I believe it's important for other young girls who might be in the same same situation as I am. It would be uh, wrong of me to not speak out for so many other girls. Yeah, it's very, very bold of you to do so. And Cynthia, are you going to keep running yourself, keep coaching? Yes, um, I I will keep running, um, keep competing. Um, However, you know, I... I do have an issue with some of the associations allowing this to happen. At some point, I might just say, hey, I don't want to compete at the world level until you make a fair playing field. Like, I really feel kind of passionate about that. Um, I'll still run the number one world time um, as I have been, but uh, I'm really getting a little disheartened and disappointed in the associations that are making these rules based on feelings and not based on the facts and science. Mm. Wow. Well said. Thank you both so much uh, for being willing to join the show, but also for being willing to speak out. This is a very controversial issue, even though I I think it shouldn't be, but it is. Um, And it's incredibly bold of both of you to really be taking a stand and being willing to share your personal stories. So thank you. Oh, mahalo. We appreciate you. you. Yeah. Thank you all so much.